Zach, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I, I'm really, really looking forward to this one. Uh, you know, the nature of what you do is just so interesting to me. Uh, I can't wait to introduce listeners to kind of like the, just the incredible feats of endurance of Zach Bitter. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's uh, an interesting sport. I think, uh, you know, I was certainly in the same camp as I think a lot of people who haven't done an ultra marathon before at one point in my life, where it's like, First of all, why would you do that? And second of all, I can't do that. So it's it's kind of funny how things change over the years. Yeah, well, it's funny. I mean, you seem like such a likable, reasonable guy, and it's like, why would he do this to himself? <laughs> you know, it just—I mean, just when I when I look at some of the the distances, hundred miles, sixty-two miles, fifty miles, um, it's just remarkable. And, and maybe that's even a, a great place to start for listeners who don't know what an ultra marathon is or ultra running. Uh, would you mind just kind of explaining like exactly what that entails? Yeah, sure. The The sport, I guess, is pretty broad in terms of kind of what is included in it, which I think adds to like kind of the fun nature to it, especially as it kind of grows. And there's lots more competition and things like that, where, you know, we're getting to the point where now you almost have to kind of pick some specialties and really put a lot of work in that or someone else is gonna and then, you know, outwork you with their specifics to training and racing. But right. the, the definition essentially would be anything beyond a marathon. So most people are going to consider like the 50 kilometer distance, kind of the entry to ultra mm -hmm. in, in North America, kind of the big kind of target event to get to for a lot of folks tends to be the hundred mile distance. Although we have been seeing a bit of a surge in these 200 plus mile races in the last few years, there's much fewer options from those, but uh, they are getting popular too. So it, wow. can get, it can get pretty freakishly long. From a structured standpoint, you see events not too uncommon, get up to six days. So you just see how far you can get in six days. You can you know, stop whenever you want, sleep whenever you want, but ultimately you're going to get a number at the end of that six day time frame, and that's your kind of result. So, you know, depending on where your capacity is for sleep deprivation and just general like uh, <laughs> self-destruction can kind of depend on how you kind of approach some of those events. But, you know, some popular ones outside of the, you know, that tend to be like 50K, 50 mile or 80K, 100K, 100 miles. Um, you get into the timed event stuff. So you get like 12 hours, six hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, six days. Um, then you can get into these multi-stage things or these long kind of what they call like fastest known times where you're just doing a specific route. So there's not necessarily a like nice clean number tied to it, but it might be like a really mm -hmm. cool traverse or um, there's an event I'm actually currently just getting started preparing for called the transcontinental run where you run from San Francisco to New York. It's about 30, just under 3,100 miles. And you know, kind of same rule. It's like you start the clock at the beginning and you do whatever you got to do to get from one side of the coast to the other. And at the end of the whole process, you have a specific number of days, hours and minutes and seconds. And that's what you kind of take home with you as your result. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this, the sport is huge in, in that regard where there's a, literally anything you can do in those frameworks. And then you also have flat stuff, 400 meter track races, which I've done quite a mm -hmm. few of. Then you have things that are going through the mountains. You have like one of the biggest, most popular 100 milers or 100 ish milers called the Ultra Trail Mount Blanc, uh, kind of over in Chamonix. And, you know, they go through the Alps and just, you know, up and down, up and down over technical stuff. You know, it's it, there's such a wide variety when you look at even the just the terrain you have to learn to run on, uh, minus the distance and that sort of variable. Yeah, it's it's incredible. The more I looked into, you know, I was familiar with like the fifty, the hundred, the sixty-two, um, but as I was, you know, preparing for this interview, which was a lot of fun, I started seeing like all these time-based events, mm -hmm. and I when I saw that it went past twenty-four hours, I was like, these people are nuts. <laughs> um, you know, so for you, I mean, wh which of these types of ultra events do you kind of maybe naturally gravitate to, or, or what are you kind of starting to gravitate to, uh, out of interest? Yeah, my biggest focus over the, I guess, over my career, essentially, I definitely kind of phased into it though, has been just flat runnable hundred milers. So whether that okay. be kind of a runnable trail or something as controlled as a 400 meter track, or in the case of in 2019, I ran an event at the Olympic training facility in Milwaukee, Wisconsin called the Pettit Center, which was like a, I believe it was like 400 and 
38 meters or something like that but it was mm. built around speed skating rinks and hockey rinks so they kept it like completely climate controlled and uh you know so you can yeah, I, I like the runnable stuff. Um, that's kind of my first love with the sp sport was running. So uh, yeah. I, I, I tend to skew away from the events that are going to have me, you know, hiking or scrambling a huge portion of the time because I just haven't gotten quite as interested into that yet. Although I think it's mm. a really, really cool side of the sport and perhaps something I'll give a little more attention to as as I get a little further into things. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I've got a bunch of questions for you, but <laughs> th this, this uh, what did you call it? Transcontinental? Yeah, yeah, it's essentially a coast to coast run coast -to -coast, um, from San yeah. Francisco to New York. Yeah, so okay, so what what's the inspiration for that? And I I mean now I got to, you know, I'm curious like how how long are you even uh forecasting something like that's going to take? Yeah, it's a good question. I you know, it's a route I became familiar with kind of early in my career and hmm. I just remember thinking to myself, "Oh, someday I want to do that." But that's about all the further it went. It was just like at some point I'll do this, but it's kind of a you know, it doesn't really like materialize or feel real until you actually kind of decide to actually do it and start putting like dates on the calendar and that sort of stuff. So I hadn't really found a great motivator uh, to do it up until the last couple of years. I think in the back of my mind, even early on, I kind of knew like this is something that's big enough, different enough from what I've done, logistically challenging enough, I'm going to need some sort of incentive or drive outside of just my own amb ambition to do it to really kind of yeah. motivate me to pull the trigger on it and and a couple of years ago i met a guy named justin wren who uh mm -hmm. he's a, mm -hmm. essentially a humanitarian but he's also a you know a mixed martial artist a high caliber wrestler just an amazing story um you know he grew up uh just having a really rough time with uh you know, school and just making relationships and friends like that was severely bullied yeah. and, and eventually just kind of found this avenue of just like, well, you know, I can't make people like me, but I can get really good at something. And then people tend to like you. So he got really, really good at wrestling. He was, I think, national champion, like internationally competitive wrestler and ultimately, you know, started competing in mixed martial arts, including the UFC and Bellator and and along the way, I think he recognized that, uh, you know, he wasn't the only one who was having those type of situations. In fact, there were people who were much worse off than even he was in some of his worst days. And he, he kind of made it a mission or a goal of his, a life goal, so to speak, to first find what he would consider the most forgotten people on planet Earth, which he identified as the Pygmy tribe in the Congo. Yeah. And then ultimately started his, uh, his charity called Fight for the Forgotten, where uh it, it's a really cool kind of story because you know when people think of just kind of the simplicity of clean water i mean we all take it for granted especially here in the united states because you just turn on your faucet and you got clean water but you know if that goes away you know we're not talking about let's figure this out in the next six to eight weeks and then get back to normal this is like we got to figure something out in the next couple of days or yeah. you know you know water clean water gathering in third world countries is such a uh, you know, a limiter to their progress, because mm. if like essentially half of your group of people need to be spending their entire day gathering clean water, now all of a sudden, like, you're not even thinking about development, you're not thinking about building like farms and things like that, you're just trying to get to the next day. So uh, square one for him was kind of going into the Congo. And um what is it? It's like, it's like Laszlo's hierarchy of needs. Exactly. Yeah. It's like if you if you can't get past just basic food and water, right? Mm -hmm. There, there's, there's yeah. no energy or resources left to start talking about development, technological advancement. Right. Yeah. You spend 16 hours a day just getting that stuff, and then you don't got no time, yeah. no time to do anything else. So, I mean, the big hurdle for Justin in the beginning too was uh, the pygmy tribe has been was severely disadvantaged in the sense they didn't even have basic human rights. They were treated more more kid to animals than they were human beings. So he had to work closely with the local government first just to make sure, you know, everything he didn't just get taken away. Because that's actually a big problem, I guess, with the charitable side of things where people want to make donations, they want to help. But hmm. if you just kind of like pump cash into it, you, you get like local governments or people who are suppressing these individuals who are just going to come in and take it. So you're basically right. making a donation to, you know, whatever group is causing a lot of the problems in the first place. So he had to go over there and the way he describes it to me is like, first you have to make the local government or whoever's kind of controlling things in the area, recognize that your presence and your efforts to help this group is also gonna help them. 
So showing mm-hmm. them the benefit of it. And, you know, there's a variety of ways you can probably navigate that scenario, but that was his first step before he could do anything. Then, wow. then it was building wells. So like once you can build wells in these areas, now, you know, now you're in a situation where they have clean water and they can start spending more time and, uh, or having some of their population and groups have more time to focus on other things. And, uh, and then, yeah, so that's turned into building like farms and things like that, buying land so that the, the pygmy oh, tribes wow. actually have a place. Cause at the time when he went over, they were essentially like stuffed in this really tiny plot of land. And it was so small. They would actually, when, when people would die, which was frequent, they would have to bury them literally right underneath where they were living. So there's like a mound oh, of dead people that they were living on wow. top of. Yeah. So it's just an insane story. And he's been over there multiple times. He's gotten malaria and all sorts of different things in the process. Uh, and uh you know it's it's just a super inspiring story so yeah you know, when i met him and uh kind of heard what he was up to and had a chance to help kind of volunteer at some of the stuff and really see firsthand some of the impact he's had on on people with his story his message and everything he's done uh i was like this is the this is the this is the driver here <laughs> so that's what got me uh to kind of pull the trigger and put a date on it and uh september 1st is when we're gonna gonna start but it's gonna be for um Essentially, it's going to be to raise awareness and donations, uh, subscriptions to their charity and their foundation, uh, all in effort to kind of see how fast I can get across too. The, the current record is uh, 42 days and six hours by name, a guy named Pete Kosselnik. So if you do the math, that's about just over 72 miles a day. So I have no idea oh if I'll be able to get anywhere near that or what exactly I will produce on a daily basis in an end time frame. But uh, I think there's a chance I could stay on track with that. So I'll be loosely thinking about that along the way, but making sure I, you know, get across the country and, and kind of stay true to the real purpose, which is the awareness and stuff for Fight for the Forgotten. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's, I always love these stories of, you know, going after, I mean, like this to the average person sounds like an unfathomable physical feat. Um, but when you have that purpose behind it, uh, one, I think people get really excited about, you know, like one, it, ra- it does raise a lot of awareness because you're like, what about this is so important? This man's willing to run across the country 70 plus miles a day. Um, but for you, I have to imagine, you know, on something that long, there's there's going to be some moments where you're going to need that that greater purpose uh, to dig down and push on. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I was just, I was thinking about that the other day. I was talking to my wife. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm more than capable of quitting on myself. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, when you have a, a a big, uh, a big driver outside of like your own, your own ambitions, I think it really does help with that. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great uh, thing to kind of stay motivated and get through some, some lows that will ultimately happen on, you know, probably a daily basis at times, but certainly over the course of the entire project, it'll be good to know that it's, uh, you know, do, I'm doing it for something bigger than myself. And, and you know, yeah. the interesting thing too, just about ultra marathon running, and it is a pretty selfish endeavor uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, the number of hours you spend preparing, you know, that's got to come from somewhere and it likely pulls at least partly from, you know, social relationships and things that you could be doing mm. outside of, uh, you know, the training, things like that. And then ultimately on race day, a lot of times you're, you know, you're the one out there doing all the work from a physical standpoint and getting the accolades of whatever accomplishment you get, whether it be crossing the finish line of a hundred mile race, breaking a record, setting a course record, um, you know, beating your own personal best. Uh, but there's a lot of people that go into that between the volunteers at the races, the race directors, the volunteers who work at aid stations, your own crew, who usually bring a crew of people who are going to kind of jump from aid station to aid station and help you out along the way with fluids and fuel and then ultimately sometimes even pace you you know it's 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 asking a lot from from lots of other people in order for these things to kind of happen so you know one other big uh kind of catalyst to trying to do this sooner rather than later in my career is just that i've gotten you know over 10 years of ultra marathon running experience under my belt and uh it just felt like a time to kind of do something that was a little more uh, for something else versus my own kind of ambitions yeah yeah, that's amazing. Well, and that's one of the things too that's been really fascinating the more I learned about your career. I mean, 10 years of running these incredibly physically demanding races, you know, so it brings to mind all sorts of questions around, uh, in, you know, durability, 
mm-hmm. um, injury prevention. But, you know, one of the things that I want to ask when you said that this guy ran 70 plus miles a day on average, you know, when, when you go out and you run on a single day, an event of somewhere around that length, I mean, how beat up are you the next day? Yeah, and that's an interesting topic actually because for the you know to date I've done all single day ultra marathons so like okay. I'm done within a 24 hour time frame. Yeah, and the goal for those is essentially to wring yourself dry. So like you're gonna be behind on nutrition just because you're not gonna eat enough to stay on top of that. You're you know you're gonna inherit a huge calorie deficit that you'll make up in the following days, but you're setting yourself up to essentially not have to do anything for the days if not weeks afterwards. So you go in there knowing at the end of it, the next day you might barely be able to walk. Uh, Hmm. You can't do that for a project like this. So you need to be able to get up and do it again, essentially the next day. If things go well, I'll essentially run, you know, six plus weeks of an ultra marathon every day. So I need to be able to do it sustainably enough so I can get up the next day and do it again. So that means that means uh, staying on top of fluid and hydration. The way Mm -hmm. I like to describe it is if I, was just not moving at all, just kind of hanging out, working at an office or something like that, I might burn about 2000 calories in a day. So if I decided to just cut my calorie intake down by a thousand calories and just eat a thousand calories a day, I would notice that quite a bit. It would be a huge reduction. It would, I would be hungry quite a bit, most likely. uh, And I would know to make a change after a while, assuming, you know, I didn't need to lose a bunch of weight. Yeah. Now, now you put that in the context of running 70 plus miles a day where I might be burning 10,000 plus calories. Now I have a thousand calorie deficit there. I hardly notice it because I'm already eating way past satiated. I'm already eating way more than I normally would on a daily basis, but I'm yeah. still potentially losing weight to the same degree as I would on that scenario of um, 2,000 calories down to 1,000 calories. Right. So it's something that's a really kind of probably semi moving target and one I have to probably narrow down to get some ballpark numbers on before I start this just so I know like, hey, by this strategy um, is going to have me arrive in New York 20 pounds lighter than I already am. And I'm, I'm not really looking to lose 20 pounds at this point in my right in my life uh, or at any point in my life for that matter. But um, yeah, so it's like there's just like a lot of difference there where you can't go into it thinking on a daily basis, I can inherit this big calorie deficit and expect for it to go well long term. Uh, right. I have to make sure the impact forces are going to be a little lighter than they would be if I was running, like, say, all out for 72 miles. Uh, so that just means a lot more kind of walking breaks, a lot more like maybe like light running versus kind of like purposeful striding out. Uh, mm. yeah. And just, and just it's injury mitigation for the most part. I think the physiological training stimulus, there's going to be some value in doing some kind of short-term simulations in the weeks and months leading into it. Uh, but ultimately I think the fitness side of thing is more like a lifetime of running and that's where I'm going to kind of get it across the country from a physical standpoint. The rest yeah. is just making sure I don't turn up, you know, acquiring an injury that's so bad that I can't move forward. Um, so Pete, I actually interviewed him for my podcast, uh, a few weeks ago. And I just asked him like, awesome. what was, what was his kind of approach with that? And he was pretty actually, I was actually kind of surprised how laid back he was about the whole project and it's in general, but he, he got out fairly aggressive and I think he was hitting closer to 80 miles a day the first few days. And then he got to the Sierras where, you know, you're going to go uphill for a good chunk of that before you kind of peak out there and then start coming back down before entering like Nevada and heading towards Utah. And he said going up the Sierras, uh, he just overdid it a bit. And just the difference in flexion, Pete's from the Midwest. So he's done a lot of of paved flat stuff. So he's really built and designed to handle a big training load from that. But just Hmm. the variance of having that like maybe six to 8% incline consistently for a majority of the day, aggravated the tendon that kind of runs down his shin onto his foot um, yeah. and and he actually had to take a day off i think within the first week so when you think about that like he actually averaged closer to like 74 75 miles a day uh he just had to take a day off because he overreached a little bit early so that was one of his big piece of advice is like you know be open to kind of being a little conservative in the early stages just because you know you want to make sure that if, if you can avoid having to take a day off, that's going to pay pay off big time versus, you know, trying to grab a few extra miles here and there in those first couple of weeks and digging yourself into a hole you have a hard time getting out of. 
Yeah, it's just, I mean, the sheer number of, I mean, like literally footfalls, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and if you throw in like a new stimulus like that, like an incline, um, and you haven't trained for that, oh, I'm just thinking, you know, like, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of people who are listening who probably pulled an Achilles tendon or yeah. Yeah. have had shin splints. Mm -hmm. And just the daunting thought of having that happen like a week in and being like, oh my God, like I am in Nevada. <laughs> you know, I got to get to the other side of the country. It's like, how do you, how could you deal with that? So fr from your standpoint, as you think through this, and it sounds like you are talking to people uh, who've either done it or done similar events, like what is your, your injury mitigation strategy? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, um, you know, there's a few things I'm going to be doing kind of going into it. I'm going to probably try to add like somewhere in the neighborhood of about five pounds of extra, like just kind of lower body muscle in the months mm. leading into it. Uh, just from a, like, there's nothing fast about this. In fact, I'll be running, I'll be moving when you add in kind of average paces, roughly probably close to twice as slow as I would race a hundred my flat hundred miler at. Yeah. So, so there's, there is like, there's no reason that like, you know, there's no reason for me to try to get down to what would be considered kind of my like goal race weight for a typical like single day ultra marathon. I'm better off being a little stronger and a little more durable. So like I'm going to focus like heavily on some kind of key areas, like kind of ankle spots, making sure my ankles are mobile, but very strong. Mm. Uh, other things just like, uh, you know, the quadricep strength and things like that, especially around the knee area. Um, yeah hip mobility and strength like that. So a lot of things that I'll be doing to kind of help with that will be mobility stuff for those areas alongside kind of building strength within um, some of the kind of core lifts like the squats, deadlifts, kettlebell swings, box steps and that sort of stuff and and fairly heavy weight relative to what I can do uh, hmm. along the way. And, and then so as you, I get, so you, do you, do you always, um, apologies for interrupting. Do, do you like, as, as you're prepping for a normal, like one day event where you are going to go all out is strength training, something that you, uh, typically incorporate into your training throughout the year? Yeah, it is. I'll just probably lean into it a little more for this particular project. Um, yeah. cause I think it's going to be, I mean, it's durability, like durability is the name of the game here. If you stay injury free, it won't matter if I'm, 140 pounds or 150 pounds or somewhere in between like it's going to be whichever one of those it puts me in the strongest most durable positions to stay upright get up the next day and do it again and and not not break down too much yeah so i mean i, and I had fun looking back at, at what i could uh find of your running career i think you've done at least nearly 60 races uh by my count and maybe it's more um you know, how, how have you uh, been so durable over the long run? Because it just seems like the sheer amount of just pounding you're putting on your legs in just a single event and then doing multiple events over the course of the year. You know, are there things that you're doing throughout the year that you feel have been really pivotal um, to kind of your sustained durability? Yeah, there's uh, it's interesting because I mean you do see a pretty wide landscape of durability within the endurance running community. It, it does seem like everyone's kind of destined to get injured at some point, uh, but there are folks who it's pretty rare, and there's folks where it seems like it's just a matter of time every year they're going to pick up some sort of thing that keeps them from getting to a race. Where I've been really fortunate the majority of my running career in general, I had a kind of a bigger hiccup my sophomore year in college where I missed an entire indoor outdoor season and okay. I had some some training where I had some Achilles tendonitis stuff earlier in my post high school introduction to collegiate running uh, stuff. Um, but since then, I've really since I've been started altering, I've really only had one injury that's really been significant in the sense where it kind of canceled some uh, some long term race plans. Uh, yeah. And but I tend to be a type of person I think who just responds well to pretty high volume of training like that hmm. doesn't break me down nearly as much as say like short intervals would just and, like physiologically that's just one of your uh benefits or advantages yeah I'd probably have my parents to thank more than anything for that it's like one of those yeah, things yeah. where it's like you look across the landscape of runners and um you do have like a fair bit of a variance in terms of like whether someone's kind of a speed responder or a volume responder I've got friends who it's like if they go up above 70 miles a week training, it's almost a guarantee they're going to get some sort of overuse injury, but they can just mm. bang out short interval session after short interval session and bounce right back and be ready to do it the next day. Whereas I'm kind of a bit more on the opposite side. If you start 
stringing together short interval after short interval after short interval, I'm probably going to get dinged up or just start to mm. kind of regress because I won't recover from it as quickly. But I could go out and do back-to-back -back long runs day in and day out and make it from one day to the next without feeling like I have a whole lot of injuries creeping up on me. So um, that's, that's probably part of the reason why I ended up in ultra marathon running in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Well, and you know, um, how, how much of the draw for ultra marathon running for you is mental? And here's why I ask for someone like me, like kind of on this topic, I, I'm certainly much more in the camp of like quick twitch, you know, mm -hmm. all growing up, I was drawn to short sprints, jumping, what have you. Um, the thought of like having to go out and run a mile again right now, I'm like, Oh, um, so for you, you know, knowing that the marathon exists, like how much of the draw to the, to the ultra community was mental? Like, it, it, is there a mental aspect to this that like, it, is it about the challenge? Um, you know, what, what draws you to it? Yeah, it's definitely evolved over the years. I think like in the early days, it was just kind of this mindset of, um, you know, my favorite long or my favorite workout in college and the years after college was just, you know, running relatively slow, long miles. I always loved our Sunday morning long run in college. And then the first couple of years after I basically only did those type of things. I kind of cut speed workout altogether for a while Yeah. before I started kind of taking training a little more seriously in the sense of just trying to you know, kind of peak for actual races again. And um, so that, that, that was definitely kind of a, maybe a good introduction to ultra marathoning when, when that's kind of your favorite workout and you don't have a problem getting motivated to do it. It just mm. makes sense to peak for a race that's like, you know, 50 miles or further. Uh, you know, as I kind of got into the sport though, and you start to kind of just see like the whole, the whole process a few times in a row, I started gravitating more away from like, oh, this is just a sport I'm better at than I am any other sport. Therefore, it's what I should spend my time on. And I got mm. much more interested in just kind of like the whole approach to saying, okay, this is the race I'm excited to do. What exactly do I need to do between now and that race, whether that be like four months, six months or whatever time frame it really is. And just kind of like the planning, the organization and the building process. I really like to look at that and see like, okay, when I do these workouts, this is what I get in return for, from a fitness standpoint. And then just shuffling yeah. things around to the point where, how am I putting myself in the best position to have my best race and looking at it less as like, okay, I'm going to go into this race and try to beat someone. Or I'm going to try to go into this race and beat a specific time, but more about, I really want to see like, you know, what works best for me. I'm, I'm really curious with that stuff. I'm, I've tried a variety of different things and I have some suspicions as what likely is going to work best for me in most cases. Uh, but that part is really fun for me to kind of see that progress along the, 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 the buildup. So I've gotten to a point now where like, if I have a bad race, I'm not nearly as maybe disappointed as I would have been in the, in pr prior years earlier in my career, where I look at it like, Oh, that was a waste of four months of training. <laughs> I look at it more as like, okay, what did I learn from this process? Yeah. Uh, and take inventory of that stuff and then kind of go back to the drawing board and say, okay, how can we fine tune it? I, I really like that part of the sport and being that ultra marathoning, is a bit more of a niche sport a fringe sport even though it has grown quite a bit in popularity over the years it's mm -hmm. just very understudied relative to most endurance events right. so so there's a lot more room i think for anecdotal type of uh exploration and just like finding what works versus oh we've got hundreds of great studies on the 10 kilometer race and you know in any ideal situation this is basically the way to do it um, you yeah. just don't have that with ultra marathon, partly just because of what we talked about earlier, such a vast range. Like it's the, how you train for a 50 kilometer is going to be quite a bit different than how you would train for like the transcon run that I'm about to do and then everything in between. So there's just a lot more room, I think, for curiosity, for speculation, for like, you know, like, we're still very much, I guess what I'm saying, still very much finding what is ideal in most hmm. cases versus kind of having to kind of s narrow it down to the individual level and respond to your own lifestyle and your own goals and your own strengths and weaknesses and ultimately developing a plan that's going to work for you. Yeah. And that's so cool because to your point, it, it really is kind of uncharted territory for to make a terrible pun. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I guess knowing that how much of your success to date do you think is just kind of like physical talent 
versus your ability and, and like the enjoyment you take in like the strategy, the build up, the mapping out, the the testing and learning on yourself over time. Like to, to what do you attribute, uh, you know, as to kind of like the key to your success? Yeah, it's a good question because I think like when you square my ultra running uh, race resume with my like high school and collegiate racing stuff, it would be pretty clear that, you know, no one would argue that I was a better high school and collegiate runner than I am an ultra marathon runner. So there does seem to be at least some kind of maybe, I don't know, like a uh, difference where I'm, I just tend to get a little or I regress a little less as the distances get longer, perhaps, or, or mm. it could just be something completely different too, where, you know, there's a different population of people competing in ultra marathons than there typically are in, in standard endurance races. And we don't necessarily know like where the limits are to human potential in a lot of these events yet. Cause it is a little less, you know, you whittle down the population by the time you get up to a hundred miles of number of people who are willing to do it much less, even take a shot at it more than once or, or at all. So there's some of that, I'm sure. And I think a big part of it, though, is just, you know, finding a purpose in the sport. And mm. even if that changes, recognizing what it truly is and being honest with yourself about that. So you're not just kind of kidding yourself about why you're doing it and trying to trick yourself into doing the work. And yeah. I think when you find those real authentic reasons to be doing it, it's going to be incentivize you to do things the way that you know is right for you. And hmm. that's going to be more likely to keep you healthy, less injury prone, and ultimately excited to be doing what you're doing. And in a sport like ultra marathoning, where the intensity is drastically lower, it's not necessarily something where you have to be super young. So there's not this like really tight window of time where like, if I don't figure things out by age 26, I'm done because my sweet spot is in the next like five years. And I really need to be like fine tuned by then and be able to really focus on development versus like right. you know, finding where my strengths and weaknesses are. So ultra running thing, I think is just a little longer timeline to do that. And if you do it right, you end up in a scenario like where I am, where I've got, uh, you know, over 10 years of ultra marathon racing and training with very little injury. Uh, you know, that just adds up. It's like a lifetime of training stimulus where you kind of know, you know a lot more about you, you know a lot more about your fitness, you know, like when it's appropriate to reach and not reach. And you can just really fine tune things a lot more intimately than you maybe would have been early in the career. So I think a lot of my sex al success also has to do with just, you know, the ability to find a sustainable approach for me that has kept me in the sport as long as it has, you know, versus, you know, what might happen with folks who kind of get into it and overreach early on and have a great couple of years, but then kind of fall away because they can't stay healthy or stay motivated to keep doing what they originally started doing. Yeah. Well, and if you don't mind me asking, and I'm sure it's evolved over time, but for you now at this point in your career, like kind of what is that driving purpose? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a combination of things at this point. It's uh, it's like I said before, I really do still get excited about sitting down and planning out how am I gonna like build out this training plan. Yeah. Uh, I'm very fortunate that the sport I do has that vast variety. So if I start getting stagnant in the preparation required for say a flat hundred miler, I can go do something in the mountains, which is gonna be a completely different experience for the most part, or just a different distance altogether. And what I found, especially as I got later in the, my career, is that is a very important tool that I'll use where if I spend a good amount of time kind of doing a few cycles of training for a specific type of event, it's in my best interest usually to step away from that for maybe half a year and do something completely different. Because then when I come yeah. back to it, that excitement's back and I'm really ready to put in the work and do it at my best versus kind of just going through the motions and uh, normalizing uh, a slightly less than ideal buildup. Uh, so that's really helpful. Just kind of having access to that. It's not like if I were just like a professional 10 K runner, there's only so much wiggle room there. It's like, I got to do what I got to do to be best at the 10 K and that might not yeah. change much. So I think that's a lot more mentally challenging than say, just being kind of like a multi-surface multi-distance ultra marathon runner. Um, it'll be, I'll be curious to see how that evolves over the next like decade or so. As, like I said, the sport continues to grow, it gets more competitive. I mean, there might be a scenario where in order to be, you know, a quote unquote elite athlete in the sport of ultra marathon, you have to decide, Hey, I want to be a hundred K specialist, or I want to be a right. mountain hundred miler specialist and really spend the majority of your career focusing on that stuff. Um, but other stuff too, is just like, I'm, I'm a curious person. So, you know, early on in my career, I got really interested in just finding out how fast I could run a controlled hundred mile course. 
So I've been fortunate that over those years, I've been able to make incremental progress in that. So there hasn't been huge stalling points where I said, okay, enough is enough. I've found my limit. I still hmm. got, I'm still at a point where I think I can go faster. And yeah, as long as amazing. that, yeah, as long as that is there, I think I'll always be motivated to kind of take another swing at it. So that's a big part of it too, is I've got this kind of, I guess, appetite, uh, not necessarily to compete with other people all the time, but just to see where my limitations are and find that, you know, walk away from the sport someday thinking, yeah, I got every last second out of that event and I can definitely hang my hat on that. Yeah. Well, and for you, you know, as you kind of assess where you are right now, I mean, understanding endurance is different than, you know, some of these, you know, high impact sports where the, the average NFL career is like three to four years, you know, endurance, you can do it for a lot longer. Like, where do you feel like you are in terms of kind of like your peak racing ability? I think you said you're still getting faster. Um, do you expect that there will be a point where that'll start to plateau or like, do you feel like you've kind of got it mapped out and you've been patient enough that you can kind of just keep just getting a little bit better each year? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's a, a little more of a fuzzy timeline, I think, with ultra marathon. I mean, we've got a, a guy, a specific example, Jeff Browning, who's close to 50 years old and he's still running some of the best hundred milers in his career. So amazing. It, it does seem like it's a pretty drawn out timeline. And, and yeah. you know, as health and nutrition and recovery practices and techniques, technology improves, you know, you start, you see all the sports kind of stretching out a little longer in terms of how long some oh, yeah. of these players can make it even in the high impact sports. So, uh, I think if I'm honest with myself though, I've probably got another, like say five to 10 years where I could really push the needle on what I could do on like say a flat hundred miler. Which I'm um, sure is a terrifying statement for everyone else who's competing against you. But, uh, <laughs> well, that five, might depend on the course. There's some five mountain guys. to ten years. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's some there's some mountain trail guys who are like, yeah, but let them come out here. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, we'll, yeah, different ball game a little we'll bit. Sh we'll show them the way up this mountain. Yeah, gotcha. the, so there's there's definitely some of that, and um, but yeah, I think uh, the interesting thing about that is there's also another event I'm really interested in. I just haven't had a I think a great opportunity at my career to really fine tune what's going to work well for me in terms of preparation, as well as just mental execution is this 24 hour event where you see how far you can get in 24 hours. Yeah. Have and you done that yet? I've done them, but they've all been like, like epic blow ups essentially. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I, like I actually, to be fair, I've done two where it was essentially just, I'm going to jump in this thing and see what happens. And yeah. after the second one of those, I was like, okay, this, this particular event requires its very own, very particular buildup and kind of a training cycle. And, you know, I have to really be focused on that alone versus I'm going to really get good for this hundred miler and then jump in one of these and see what happens kind of a mindset. Right. So I've really only done one where I actually like set out to peak for it. Um, and I made a lot of mistakes, I think, in hindsight. Uh, but that's kind of how I've done a lot of these things, too, is you you do it for the first time. And when you step away and look at it, even if it is a decent result, uh, you can say, like, okay, this is what I would have done differently to improve this. This is what I would have done differently. And you just gather a lot of, uh, like, lessons to kind of learn from and then fine-tune as many of them as you can, try again, whittle that list of failures and unsuccessful things down smaller until you get to the point where there's hardly any or any of them. And then that's when you probably have your best race. So I'm just very early on in that process. So I, who knows, maybe I'll need a few more uh, struggle fests out there for 24 hours before I really find a, find a good one. But that's something I'm excited to do. It's yeah. also an event that I think you can be a little older yet and still be quite successful at. So uh, I'm, I'm somewhat leaning on the whole transcon experience to almost kind of be a little bit of a paradigm shift in terms of the mental aspect of the sport for me to really help me maybe better wrap my head around, okay, 24 hours of running this pace, I'm going to go through the night. So sleep deprivation is a reality and just all mm -hmm. the things that are unique to that distance. I think there'll be some takeaways from the transcon, even though my plan is to sleep every night during the transcon, except for perhaps the last night if I'm getting close enough to New York and it right you're gonna push me. it yeah 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 but up until then you know I'm probably gonna be pretty pretty smart with uh trying to sleep but I think it's uh there'll be a lot of uh uh kind of I think relative things about that that'll kind of put me in a position to maybe minimize what it will actually take to properly execute a 24 hours so that's something I'm kind of excited about doing and I'm not I couldn't tell you what age you peak out at that there's there, there's uh you know it's probably somewhere in the upper 40s or so before you get to a point awesome. where 
now now you have you know younger folks who have also had enough time in the sport where they can really maximize it or we'll see more people just focusing on that specific event and making it difficult to stay competitive and all that stuff that kind of comes with the like progress and development within a specific sport hmm well and with like this kind of i mean because it's you know i hear about ultra marathoning or ultra running i guess way more in the last five years mm -hmm. than i ever did before i mean if you would have said ultra running i would have no clue what you're talking about um do you see a path and uh, apologies if this is an ignorant question but is there a path for this eventually to be like an olympic event you know is it is it trending in that direction maybe for any of the distances on flat surfaces or yeah i think it there i think it'll probably will be at some point uh so mm -hmm. much of that is political though so it's like it's really a little goofy the, the weird thing is in the sport of ultra marathon running this most recent surge there's been different waves throughout history where the sport's gotten more popular and then kind of like settled back down into the background and then kind of popped back up so we're definitely currently on an upswing which more or less kind of started right when I kind of got into the sport, like unrelated to anything I was doing, but like, it, no, I, come just, on. I, just happened to, I just happened <laughs> to be jumping in when it started to get popular again, but it got way more popular at a much faster rate on mm. a lot of the trail side things. So the, oh. the hard part about doing an Olympic sport is that a lot of times they want to make those type of events fairly controlled so there's not huge variance when you go from one country to the next you're not creating like this massive like home court advantage so to speak yeah so that would put us more likely to want to do something like a 100 kilometer or a 24 hour where you can make a course for 100k or 24 hours almost identical from one country to the next every mm. four years so there's some precedent there's some comparability and that sort of thing yeah so it may need to be in one of those two events since currently hmm. 100K and uh, 24 hours both have world championship events, which is kind of the step before you would become an Olympic sport. Yeah. Uh, that So that may help out. I mean, there's also 50 kilometer world championships and there's different like cross country type stuff. So there's definitely some potential there. Um, but ultimately it'll probably take, uh, you know, the right person to really want it to happen and then, you know, some sort of like, I don't know, like financial move. <laughs> it's all about what, what, the money. Yeah, whatever, whatever gets it popular enough to generate. Uh, eventually, the Olympic, the Olympic folks have to get to the the degree where they look at it and say, oh yeah, we can make a bunch of money if we bring this in as a sport, and then it'll become an Olympic sport. Right. No, that that makes complete sense. Well, um, and, and actually, maybe to shift gears just a little bit, something that I wanted to, to ask you about. Now, you've held a number of world records, but the one that for me, I was like, holy shit, how did he do that? The Was it the, tw oh, we got 100 miles on a treadmill? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. How, here's a question I have for you, and here's where I'm going with this too. Like, the, the mental fortitude it must take to get through a hundred mile event is something that I'm just not, uh, I can't even really grasp. And I would love to get your take on kind of like what's going through your head during these different phases of the race, but at least like the scenery is changing. I imagine in most circumstances, like how did you maintain like the mental focus to complete 12 hours straight on a treadmill in a room, you know, like how, <laughs> yeah, I was definitely for that particular event leaning much more on just kind of experience than I was specificity. I uh, I kind of just jumped on that opportunity real real last minute as a, oh, okay. a filler because I had been training for a flat hundred miler and it got canceled. Like I think maybe like six weeks before with all the COVID stuff in early 2020. Yeah. So I was, you know, I had put so much work in already. I was like, well, I want to do something. And and that mm -hmm. was really my only option. So I never, I never ran past 30 miles on a treadmill before then in one session. So uh, I made a ton of mistakes on that day. And, uh, you know, some of it was uh, probably correctable had I done it before, had trained, say, for 16 weeks on a treadmill and really got things fine tuned on that. Uh, yeah. but for what it was, I think it was a really fun experience and kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, there was a, there's a guy, uh, um, uh, who just Taggart Van Eaton, who just recently broke that record actually. I just saw that out in like and, Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. He, and he put yeah. in just some freakish training for it. I think he spent about 16 weeks building up specifically for it. He put in, a, I think he even had a 75 mile long run on the treadmill. So he dialed it in, like he definitely dialed yeah. it in and then it showed on race day for him or event day for him. 
uh, in terms of like he worked out probably a lot of the kinks that I wasn't that I hadn't by kind of just spending the time and and mm-hmm. energy into really getting to know the treadmill and the ins and outs of that and the psychological battle, like you mentioned, that is being on a treadmill yeah. versus controlling your efforts a little more uh, split second based. Because the biggest thing I noticed outside of just um, kind of figuring out, well, how do I mitigate the heat in the room versus like what I would do when you're kind of running through air versus essentially wallowing in your own heat and the heat coming up off the treadmill and uh, mm. you know, everything else was just this like, um, kind of mental, uh, psychological, like pull to want to gain control when you don't have it, because you're just always responding to the machine, regardless of whether you're changing the paces or not. And right. uh, it seemed like, uh, like Taggart was, had, did quite well at that. I don't know how many times he stops to use the bathroom or anything like that, but it, it didn't, it, it couldn't have been very often given his splits. So, um, he certainly solved that puzzle before he went into it, whereas I don't think I did. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's uh, a testament to his preparation. Um, but it was a cool experience. Um, something I, I, I don't know that I'd say I would never do it again. I think I would do it again in the right scenario, but I would probably be like a big convention hall or something at like a trade show where you can have a lot more moving air, a lot more like cooling options and just some uh, energy from the crowd yeah, and interaction. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. I weren't you you were in your house, right? Like Yeah, you, yeah. You're just in a in a normal room there, there <laughs> like, a, like like most people have when they run on a treadmill. Yeah, there there is a fair bit of let's cross our fingers and hope this works because you know, I mean, even even uh with, with the the timeline we had and stuff too, it's like I didn't really have a big opportunity to do a real good stress test on our setup. So we 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 were able to kind of test things individually but not necessarily all going at once with like the live stream the guests getting phoned in and and the the air conditioning and the power to the treadmills in fact we had too much power running through the room i did have it in where my treadmills were shutting down for about the first third or so so i was kind of bouncing back and forth between the two treads thankfully we had two so i wasn't like just standing there waiting for it to get remedied but eventually when i think i got maybe a third of the way through we realized that it was just the amount of power we're running through that side of the house. And we took an extension cord and ran it to the other side of the house. You had to get on another circuit. Yeah. So we got on another circuit and then it wasn't an issue after that. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so that was a little bit of learning on the fly with that one, but it was kind of a fun, fun event to do, especially since there wasn't anything else really to target anyhow. Yeah. Well, that was my first question. I was like, well, treadmills run that long. <laughs> like, y- you know, like I was like, can the treadmill handle that? Let alone like him being able to, deal with the psychological piece um yeah. and, and one one question for you too is you know you've you've now done this like we said for 10 years when you go out and do these races are you still hitting these kind of psychological barriers that most people are familiar with when they try and do any sort of long distance run um or do they do they tend to kind of happen in the same sequence over the course of the race You know, what is that experience for you like now mentally? And I guess, you know, depending on how you respond to it, like what is your kind of like mental approach over the course of the race? Yeah, as far as I can tell, the same barriers are kind of present. They they don't always pop up at the same time, but there's a fairly kind of routine trend. And I think what happens is you start to you start to recognize them and what they actually are. So there you learn like what is the difference between i just don't have it today versus i'm in a low point and if i kind of stay focused and recenter i'll get through this and then i'll be laughing about how i feel better after running five miles than i did back there which is just a weird mind trip because right. when things start going badly or you hit a low your mind goes straight it's just going to linearly get worse it can't get better but it can certainly get worse and you you start thinking about it that way that's yeah. like that that's that's a recipe for either having a death march to the finish or dropping out uh so you just learn i mean you i've had you get enough situations where you have a race where you just have a really good day about hitting these rough spots and then pushing through them and refocusing and then that gets you if you, if you sit down and actually reflect on those experiences and are honest with yourself you can pinpoint points in other races in the past where you didn't and it wasn't because you couldn't but it's because for whatever reason that day you didn't decide to focus in and mentally get over that hurdle and i think knowing that is a pretty good driver at least for me now that when i get to those points in a race i have to be honest with myself because i have that intel i have to be honest with myself Mm. that like if i'm gonna pull the plug here 
it's it's it, it can't be because I just don't feel like doing it now. It has to be because, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I made a mistake that's uncorrectable or it's you know, it's not a goal event. So I'm not going to do damage when I need to be focused on something else or, mm. you know, that sort of stuff, because there's definitely opportunity costs, to, you know, blowing up and pushing through <laughs> versus, uh, you know, pulling the plug and getting out of an event when the damage isn't as bad. Uh, and you have to kind of go through, I think, the process of running running a few of them to kind of figure out where that line is for you personally, and then ultimately be honest with yourself so you can, uh, even if you do make a mistake and pull the plug early, look at it and learn from it and take that forward to whatever event you're going to do next and, and kind of make sure it doesn't happen again and you don't make the same mistake twice. Yeah. And, you know, it, you seem, um, and I mean this in the best of, of ways, so calculated um, do you have kind of like a specific process that you go through post race, either immediately after in the days after where you kind of assess how that went areas of improvement or mm -hmm. things that you want to note for future events? Yeah, I think I think there's I like to look at it through this lens, there's like some really big movers that are going to really like make big headway for you and get you most of the way there. And if you can get very good at those and really learn how to dial those in, then then you can afford yourself the time and energy to kind of nitpick at little things and make marginal improvements that are going to maybe push you to the next level to a small degree. Uh, but you got to get those big movers out of the way first. So, you know, mm. for me, the big ones are just the proper training stimulus that's specific to the race distance and intensity you're doing. Uh, the rest portion, which I think is heavily steeped in sleep and then nutrition. Those are the three big ones that I'm always kind of like, let's get these all dialed in. And then once I get those dialed in, uh, I can start worrying about like smaller things like uh, how do I change the variance of this workout or do I take an ice bath after this workout and that sort of stuff. Um, so like, yeah, so it's uh, after a race, I'm definitely leaning quite heavily on the sleep and the nutrition side of that so that I am, you know, making sure that I am absorbing that stimulus and bouncing back quicker and not finding myself in a position where uh, I'm, I'm missing that window to kind of accelerate the process towards when I can get back out there and, and start training for another one. But I usually give myself about two weeks where uh, I'll focus pretty heavily on getting in kind of what uh, at that point in the season, I'll be doing a pretty low kind of almost strict ketogenic diet. Um, and then uh, I'll just try sleeping as much as I can. And I give myself about two weeks to really kind of both physically and mentally recover from the mm. event and during that time i'm also actively thinking about what do i want to do next in terms of what excites me because going into a training block i definitely want to feel both physically and mentally fresh and i really want to be excited to do the work that's going to be required to execute whatever course i train for so i'm thinking about those things while i'm going through that process to help really uh you know, dial that in and figure out what it is I actually want to do. So I don't find myself midway through the next training plan wondering, why did I pick that event? Or I don't want to be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and since you brought it up too, and, and your your diet has been well documented, and I, I know we're coming up on time, but um, the, from the sleep side of things, how, how, how much are you sleeping on average? Like, what are you shooting for when you say like, it's a huge priority, and I'm trying to sleep as much as I can? Like, what does that look like for you? Yeah, I usually feel really good if I can average between about eight or nine hours a night. So if I start slipping under eight on average for a while, it starts to kind of catch up with me, uh, or at least that's how I perceive it. Uh, if I, in usually what will happen is if I have like a string of days where I get maybe seven hours, then I'll just, you know, when I get an opportunity, I'll just like knock out a 10, 11 hour night. And uh, that's kind of my sign. Like, well, if I'm getting less than eight, eventually it's going to come back to a point where I need to like, have a really, a yeah, yeah yeah so but yeah if i can consistently get eight to nine i'm like rarely ever feel like i need a nap energy hmm. levels are super consistent throughout the course of the day training's going well and things like that so uh thankfully i've been able to dial that in pretty well and i haven't had a lot of trouble with sleep in the uh you know the past 10 years or so so it's been uh probably a strength of mine i would say that's awesome. Well, and if, if anyone's watching this, uh, it'll be on YouTube, but I, I've been drinking coffee. So I, like I said, I, I, maybe I didn't say it on the show, but I have, I have three young kids and every once in a while we get a bad night. They're getting better. Uh, but yeah, the last few weeks have just been brutal. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm maybe eking out like that six to seven and a half. I generally try and shoot for seven and a half. But when I string together a couple days, you know, where it's seven or less, it's like I feel it. Hence why. Anyways, my point was I'm drinking a lot of coffee on the yeah. show. Um, <laughs> But well, and, and, you know, I read an article, 
I can't remember if you were interviewed or, or maybe you had written it, but you said something that really resonated with me. And it's, it's about being aware of stressors and how, you know, a stressor is more than just like the physical demands that you're putting your body through. Um, if you wouldn't mind, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, you know, what, what that kind of means uh, for folks who might not be aware of what I'm referencing? <laughs> Yeah, and I really like this topic, especially because there's a big variance here. And I see it every day when I'm coaching folks who have a very different lifestyle than I do. You know, I might be coaching someone like yourself who has three kids. And, you know, that's a variable I don't have to control for. So, mm -hmm. um, but it is a stress inducer. I'm, I'm sure you love your kids and most people do, but they do cause stress, whether it be good or bad. Just a little bit. Just <laughs> so, a little bit. So looking at it kind of like, uh, you know, you have a finite amount of like stress you can tolerate before it kind of puts you in a physiological position where you're gonna have a hard time sleeping, you're gonna slow down your recovery and things are just gonna spiral in a negative fashion. Um, and you're getting those from all areas. You're getting stress from your training stimulus, you're getting stress from your family, you're getting stress from your work, your relationships, you know, if someone, mm -hmm. you know, from social media, from all sorts of stuff. So I think you need to be mindful of those things and really just kind of take a little bit of inventory about, you know, here's my three biggest weeks of training. So I'm taking on extra stress with there. Where in my life can I kind of reduce some of the other stress so I'm not necessarily increasing my overall stress, even though I'm increasing my, my training stimulus stress at this point in time. And kind of picking and choosing your battles within that. And everyone's gonna be a little different there. They're all gonna have different drivers and different like big stress points in their life. Uh, but um, I think when you kind of be honest with yourself and recognize where those things are, that's where you're going to be able to start from in terms of building a blueprint that's going to work best for you, regardless of whether it's ideal in the sense that like you're going to get the absolute best out of your, your, your potential self, because in most cases, that's just not a reality for people because, mm. you know, for, for, I mean, professional athletes are professional athletes for a reason, because they know that they need to basically eliminate almost all other life stressors in order to take on the work and the training and the recovery that they're going to need to do to compete at an international world stage level at the Olympics and things right. like that. So like the average person is just gonna be playing a slightly different game in the sense that they're doing that more as a hobby and less as a primary, like this is how I pay my bills uh, type of a mindset. And, and, and that's gonna dictate a lot in the training and it's gonna dictate a lot in just kind of how you navigate things, how you look at things, how you view things, how you, how much you beat yourself up over a missed workout or you know maybe even how you do certain workouts and when you do them and that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I think for me, that was one of the really important realizations that I've probably had in the last, I don't know, handful of years is just how cumulative stress is. And, uh, you know, I would go through periods where I just, you know, I just, I, I love training and I, I set all sorts of different goals for myself. Um, but if I'm killing myself in the gym and then I also have stress at home, you know, not all stress is bad stress, mm -hmm. but just, there's a lot of responsibility. And then you have stress at work, stress in a relationship, you know, it all compounds and then all of a sudden before you know it you're wrecked and then the ironic part about that is that that you can't sleep you're exhausted yet like your, your sleep quality gets even worse um so yeah, yeah that, that's important cut yourself a little slack it, fe it feeds into <laughs> itself it's like yeah one thing that gets out of control causes something else to unravel and before you know it you're cascading in the wrong direction and you know like i think you're right though like stress stress is what you want to get better so like i like to look at it like you want to be micro stressing yourself over a long period of time and adapting versus taking right. on these big macro stresses and then being completely tanked for a week or two and then kind of doing that again and kind of going going in that cycle yeah no and that that's actually uh a great point right there i, um, I say that but then september i'm going to do basically six weeks of macro stressing so. <laughs> Well, we'll have you back on. We'll hear how it went. <laughs> it went terrible. No, no, no. Uh, well, awesome. I, I know you have a lot going on. Uh, for folks who want to follow you both just in, in everyday life and uh, pay attention to when you do this big transcontinental run, uh, you know, where, where can we point them? Yeah, my kind of one stop area is my website at zachbitter.com. You can find like my social media channels there, my coaching services, kind of the products and sponsors that support me. I've got some discounts for folks on there if they are interested in using the same stuff I do. Uh, that's that's kind of the, the big one. Podcast is Human Performance Outliers podcast. Uh, my most active social media channel is probably Instagram. That's just at Zach Bitter. Awesome. And make sure and check that out, folks. More great content from Zach 
over at the podcast. Uh, well, perfect, man. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. And I think there's a lot here that uh, people are going to be able to take away from this one. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. It was a blast. It's always fun to chat about running and everything else that comes with it. You got it. Absolutely.